We're going to get started. If you could mute your mics now. Um, so welcome. It's uh, Wednesday, April 22nd. Thank you for joining us for another update. Uh, today we have uh, Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Shuli Wong. We'll have an update from Regional Chair Karen Redman, and then we'll close out with some information from Region CAO Mike Murray. So we're going to kick it off with Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Shuli Wong. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'll start with some overall trends uh, regarding long-term care home and retirement homes. So there are currently 11 long-term care or retirement homes in outbreak. Six have had their outbreaks declared over. Since Monday's update, uh, there has been an increase in the number of new confirmed cases to 550 overall in the region as a result of the expanded testing for priority groups, in particular in long-term care and retirement homes. We expect to continue to see significant increases in the number of confirmed cases in the days ahead as a result of expanded testing. A few words about Forest Heights Rivera. As you are aware, Forest Heights uh, long-term care Rivera has experienced a substantial outbreak of COVID-19. As of 7 p.m. last evening, uh, there are 103 cases among residents, 41 among staff, and sadly 12 COVID-19 associated deaths. In collaboration with Ontario Health's Waterloo Wellington Health System Response Team and the teams at Forest Heights and Rivera, a plan was put in place to move some residents out of the home into area hospitals. Approximately 40 residents are currently in the process of being moved temporarily to the most appropriate available hospital beds. Uh, the movement of residents will not in, impact the hospital's ability to admit new patients or care for their current patients. Additional staffing supports from the health system response, such as additional personal support workers, are also being deployed to Forest Heights. Strong outbreak measures continue to remain in place at Forest Heights. Daily calls and communications with Forest Heights Rivera continue to happen with public health and multiple health system response partners. I am very grateful for the high level of professionalism and collaboration that exists across our region's health care system. And I am thankful to all three of our local hospitals. Their ongoing support is truly valued. In closing, our challenging times continue, but our combined efforts are making a difference, as we have seen locally and also with the most recent projections released by the province's COVID-19 task force on Monday. While these projections are encouraging from a community transmission perspective, as we know, outbreaks in long-term care and retirement homes are still very much a major issue. And I must remind everyone in Waterloo Region that we still have a long road to travel and we must stay the course. To everyone limiting the number of times you leave your home, to everyone who has sacrificed visiting loved ones, to all the kids not seeing their friends right now, you are helping to slow the spread of COVID-19 and you are making a real difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. We'll now have a brief statement and update from Regional Chair Karen Redman. Thanks, Julie. I wanna thank Dr. Wong for the important update she just gave and for the collaborative work of you and your health care partners. I want to thank the frontline care workers and the first responders who continue to work tirelessly to keep us safe. We're grateful for your service and for your sacrifice. 
I'd also like to thank employees who are keeping essential regional services going, keeping our water safe, keeping our transit services going, providing child childcare uh, for uh, essential workers, caring for our seniors, working with the homeless and the vulnerable populations, making sure waste pickup and so much more. This is a National Volunteer Week, so I'd also like to recognize the service of those in our region who regularly volunteer their time and skills to support our community, especially at a time when we need them the most. Here at the region, we have 2,500 dedicated volunteers who help support our programs, events, and residents. Volunteers can be found at Sunnyside Seniors Residence, childcare centers, at our museums and libraries. Volunteers run our tax assistance program. Events like the Children's Groundwater Festival wouldn't exist without the over 1,000 volunteers who come out every year to help. As I've said before, we live in a caring community that looks after each other. During this pandemic, volunteers throughout the region, uh, regional seven area municipalities are also rolling up their sleeves to help. Whether it's sewing masks, making food or deliveries, or helping pack and donate PPE to frontline workers. We rely on volunteers and they are always there when we need them. To all the volunteers in our region, I say thank you. To everyone who is going above and beyond their regular commitments to help out in some way, thank you. You're what makes Waterloo Region such a special place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We'll now hear from uh, Region of Waterloo CAO, Mike Murray. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Julie. Um, and uh, thanks to Dr. Wong and, and Chair Redmond. Um, so I'm gonna do an update on two things. One is um, an update on monitoring and compliance uh, activities. And we've, we'll try to standardize on doing that once a week on Wednesdays. So I've got some data on that. And then just a really quick, um, a couple of quick thought, initial thoughts about, um, you know, what the next, uh, the next phases of this are going to look like. So in terms of um, monitoring and compliance, I'm going to give you a bunch of numbers. Uh, this will be updates on uh, numbers I think we provided last Friday. So um, what I'm going to give you is cumulative totals from March 22nd um, up to yesterday in terms of um, monitoring and compliance activities. Uh, and this is a combination of uh, regional bylaw, area municipal bylaw, public health, and water region police. So these are um, uh, aggregate um, stats. So um, from March 22nd to earlier this week, a total of 528 site visits that resulted in some education and or warning being delivered. Um, another 343 site visits where no action was required, and that is either um, it had resolved itself by the time somebody got there or they got there and there was not an issue to deal with. Um, 453 phone calls, so questions, complaints that could be dealt with over the phone and didn't require a site visit, and a total of five enforcement actions, so basically charges being laid, and I think that that is exactly the same number as we had on Friday, so no additional charges laid um, since then. So, uh, so that's kind of an update on uh, the monitoring and compliance activities. So it continues to be, you know, an active area, but overall we're seeing really quite good compliance. The other thing that I just want to mention, you know, questions are starting to come up about um, what would reopening um, look like? And I think the very short answer to that is um, we don't yet know what reopening is going to look like. Um, you know, I think the Premier was quite careful on Monday uh, in his comments about reopening, that this is going to be phased, incremental, gradual. And locally, we're going to have to take our lead and direction from the province. You know, through this whole response phase, the province has been quite directive. Uh, they've issued emergency orders that we and everyone else has had to comply with. So it's quite possible that that might be their approach to the recovery phase as well, that they be quite directive. And then basically we're following the provincial direction. Um, if they do provide some local latitude, 
then obviously we'll have to work with all our local partners to make appropriate decisions while informed by, by public health. Um, so, um, you know, rest assured that um, this organization, the region, uh, many community partners are starting to turn our minds to what will reopening look like, but we will have to wait on direction from the province uh, to make any real firm decisions. So I'm happy to take questions about that or anything else. Thank you, Mike, and to all of our speakers. We'll now turn it over to our media partners uh, for your questions, and we'll start with Ben from 570. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, so this is, I, I'm pretty sure this is a question for Dr. Wong, but we've seen Toronto Public Health uh, begin to collect race-based and other income data on those tested to find inequalities in the system. Also, our local ACB network has been asking for this. Are we going to be looking at doing something like that? Uh, thanks for your question, Ben. So um, uh, we have been collecting data um, that the province has uh, uh, requested uh, be be collected, and uh, for the time being, um, you know that's uh, that's what we'll uh, uh, be. That's what we'll be doing. I mean, I'm, I'm monitoring these these developments. Uh, the, 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 the data that we are collecting is based on what the province has asked us to collect. Okay, so so you're going to go 100% based on if the province asks you to, then you will? I'm, I'm saying that that's what we've been doing. And uh, we are right now very focused on um, our efforts uh, in long-term care home and retirement homes where there are significant issues. And in terms of our um, data collection and analysis, and uh, you know, that's all done to inform actions. So in terms of the data that we prioritize to collect in order to be able to inform actions, uh, you know, the long-term care uh, home and retirement home situation continues to be our top priority right now. Um, so I'm that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, we're collecting uh, data in order to be able to inform our decisions. And right now that's our focus. Okay. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not an important question, but. Oh, of course. Um, speaking of long-term care homes, we saw a bit of a spike in cases today at Trinity Village. Now mm -hmm. we know that uh, one of the spikes in Forest Heights was when public health proactively tested all patients. Is that what's happening at Trinity Village? Is there also a similar action plan being developed for that retirement home? Yes, thank you, Ben, that's a good question. So the uh, Ontario Health, Waterloo Wellington Health Response Team has uh, already been engaged with uh, Trinity Village uh, for a few days now. And uh, we are actively working with them uh, to ensure that they are well supported uh, and we have uh, daily calls and communications with them. So they are also experiencing a significant outbreak as, uh, as, you've, uh, as, you've, as you've seen uh, with their numbers. And so that's also a team, that's also, I'm sorry, a long-term care home that the, the response team is assisting. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ben. We'll move on to Kate from CBC. Go ahead, Kate. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, when we talk about expanded testing, uh, the numbers that are being reflected on the dashboard for the number of tests done, is that including um, long-term care homes in those numbers? Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the goal, yeah. Um, to try to capture um, a, a sense of all the numbers that are being tested across the region. Uh, yeah, some testing is occurring. A lot of testing is occurring through the hospital uh, assessment clinics, uh, some through mobile clinics, some in long-term care homes. And um, yeah, so, at, you know, all together we get aggregate numbers and that's what we post. So when I was looking at the numbers, like say for this week, um, you know, we're one day there was 90 tests, one day there was 105. Today's numbers show there was 123 over... So 123 tests on Tuesday over what we did on Monday. Mm -hmm. um, but actually the week of April 10th and to the 14th or so, we were hitting like 164 tests um, a day. And I'm wondering when we talk about expanded testing, 
is it it's expanding in long term care homes, but are we testing fewer people in the community? Mm -hmm. Is that why these numbers are okay? So mm -hmm. is it and is that because demand is not there? Like the people aren't meeting that threshold to be tested? Uh, it's it's because community transmission has significantly slowed down. Yeah, but the, 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 the testing needs in those uh, vulnerable settings has increased. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's decreased that much. Like that seems like a significant drop. When you think about like Rivera where there's, you know, 240 people who were tested, mm -hmm. um, is, is that shocking to you to see that kind of community need for testing drop? No, uh, and I also have to, I have probably have to put out um, sort of disclaimer that this, this daily testing is quite, uh, it can be quite variable, um, right? Uh, it, it, it's also a, a question of daily collation of numbers and postings. And it, it could be things where there could be times when we don't, we're not able to get everything together for every 24 hour cycle to reflect exactly what happened in the last 24 hours, just because there's so much testing going on. So I would just, I would just treat those numbers as even though, you know, we do our very best and our partners do our very best to get us all the numbers on a daily basis in order to keep the community informed, which is, you know, our goal. I would just put a disclaimer that it's very difficult to, it, it's not probably appropriate uh, to look at it on a day-to-day -day basis to gouge, you know, whether testing has gone up or, or it, it, because it's so uh, fluid and, and rapid in terms of, you know, numbers of tests and getting all that data in. It's just to give an indication, I think, uh, to the community that, um, you know, in line with the expanded uh, testing uh, um, direction and guidance from the province, we are enacting as quickly as we can um, all that expanded testing. And fortunately, at the same time, what we're seeing from the community is a, is a real slowdown in the, in the community transmission. Um, and so, yeah, I would just say, I, I would probably just say, you know, those numbers may not be entirely accurate every single 24 hour period, but they'll be caught up eventually and uh, it's just to give a sense to the community. So I hope, hope that helps. Yeah, of course. Um, just before I let other people talk, <laughs> um, yeah, sure. does the, the community part of it though, and, and the drop in the need for that, is that surprising to you that it's, it seems pretty quick that that has dropped off? Uh, I think we, we've been seeing, you know, even, even before the expanded testing, like it was a date, right? I, I announced to the media, we have these expanded groups now that uh, we can test. Even before that, we started testing more in long-term care homes, just because we, we were seeing things happen. You know, sometimes we could have been a bit ahead of the province in terms of en enacting some, some recommendations that they later enacted two or three days later, for example. So there has been a continuing climb of testing in long-term care homes and retirement homes, and now uh, increase, increases in other congregate settings as well. At the same time, there has been a decline in the community testing, but that's been difficult to visualize. And I totally agree that it has been for, 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 for the press because it sort of seemed like on this date, you know, uh, we expanded testing. Uh, but that, but that, that, but that, but that difference was also already being seen in the days prior. We were getting less and less community tests and more and more tests in long-term care home retirement homes. Do, I, do I, am, am I surprised? I'm, I'm not surprised because basically what has happened is that the community spread has really been controlled, and therefore, um, you know, the community cases have dropped. And what we've seen as a phenomenon across the country and in our region is the long-term care homes have become the area of risk. And therefore the, 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 the testing and, uh, on the, and, and the public health and system efforts have been focused on the long-term care homes and now you know, expanding to other congregate settings. Um, but that's been really a reflection of that sort of dual epi curve, which we'll, we're working on to try to illustrate on our graph better, but this, community epi curve, which seems to be, you know, heading in the right direction in this long-term care home curve where we're still on the upswing. 
Great. And just one quick follow up to Ben. Can you just confirm yes or no? Um, is the province the province is the province asking you to collect race based data? At this time, we've received no direction from the province to collect that. Okay, awesome. I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. We'll move on to Irene from Air News. Go ahead, Irene. Hello. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question for Dr. Wang or not, but um, I follow the Cambridge Hospital um, uh, emails that come out, and yeah. it seems that there's more of a concern, or there's always been a concern, for the mental health of the healthcare workers. Um, is, is this something that, um, that the province is going to keep an eye on, or is it a regional? Who's re who would keep an eye on this? I think that's a shared responsibility, Irene. Um, it's not a primary um, role of, of public health no. uh, to, to be, um, you know, following this uh, very closely, although we do report on data at community, at the community level in terms of trends. Mm -hmm. I have to say right now, we are deployed elsewhere in terms of data reporting. Right. Um, but, but I would say that, you know, I understand there has been guidance given from the ministry to, um, you know, mental health uh, and, and, and addictions providers in terms of, um, you know, supports that they can offer and, you know, other initiatives uh, that have been put in place by the province. So I, I do think the province is, is, you know, aware of this issue. And uh, I understand they're, they're providing guidance uh, to the organizations that, uh, that normally, um, you know, provide service in these areas. And okay. maybe I can just add yeah. a little bit. Um, one of the, uh, so we, there is a, the community supports group um, that's working on a whole bunch of community supports. And one of their subgroups is um, psychosocial and spiritual supports. And so they've been working with a whole number of community partners who are focused on uh, mental health supports for both for healthcare workers and for other people in the community. Um, so you can, uh, you can find out more on um, the community supports part, uh, Irene, on our, on our website. And uh, one of the things I know that's happened is um, there is this um, website and phone line. Um, it was called uh, Here 24-7. And they've rebranded that. To, I think it's now called Here For You. And there's different components of it. Um, you know, Here For You Healthcare Workers, Here For You Kids, Here For You Caregivers, um, recognizing that different uh, groups of people have different mental health and support needs right now. So there's, there's a lot of work going on by a number of community partners um, to really provide the, the mental health supports that are needed. That's great. And uh, Mike, this is a regional initiative, community support so, groups is regional? Um, yeah, so I would say go, go and have a look on, on the website. The community supports group um, includes about 40 different organizations in the community who are all engaged in providing um, different kinds of community support. So they've got a, a subgroup that's focused on um, homelessness supports. They've got a subgroup focused on food supports. Uh, they've got this uh, psychosocial and spiritual support group. They've got a group that's focused on um, pets and support for people with pets. Um, I'm probably missing one or two, uh, but so, you know, it's, it, it's um, I would say coordinated by the region, but it's really a collaborative effort by dozens, dozens of community partners. Great, that's my question, thank you. Thanks, Irene. We'll move on to Nicole from CTV. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi, good morning, give me one second here. Um, this is a question for uh, Dr. Wong. Um, what's, what are the next steps for Forest Heights? It's to continue to implement the actions that have been um, described by, by Forest Heights Rivera in their press release. Uh, I believe it was um, Monday night, uh, Tuesday morning. Um, so those are the actions and they are in the process of being implemented. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased with the collaboration that has occurred. Uh, and um, yeah, and then um, you know, we're going to continue with that action plan. Okay, um, we've heard from Forest Heights. They've uh, said that there there were um, you know several residents with four uh, to a room 
um, mm -hmm. which likely led to um, the quick spread of the virus. Is that the same case at Trinity Village? Can you just explain uh, what's going on there in terms of uh, why the spread is uh, significant there? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question, Nicole. So yeah, you know, um, I think when this is all over and we all have an opportunity to look at this more closely, um, you know, we'll probably be able to uh, better identify what were all the factors that were involved in, in spread. Uh, I think for sure, uh, you know, it's not ideal uh, to, to, uh, to not have individual rooms, but there are a lot of uh, facilities that don't currently have that, right? And so, um, it uh, what what they're what we're trying to do with Forest Heights is try to maximize the ability for the home uh, to be able to cohort uh, residents appropriately, those who are ill, those who are not ill, as well as to maximize the ability for the home uh, to do. Um, to do isolation of, of, of residents. And that's gonna be easier if a, 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 four, a four resident room is turned into a two resident room. So I think the plan is a very good plan. Uh, I think it's not possible to uh, you know, say black and white, oh, if a home has you know, these types of rooms, it's going to spread. It, it really depends on um, you know, the outbreak uh, uh, the, the specific specific uh, outbreak in that in that home and the specific measures that are being put in place. What I can tell you is that every home is is receiving uh, you know d d direction and guidance on how to implement um, the the uh, the uh, the the best measures possible, and um, that's the important thing you know when we look at this uh, going forward. And if we are we if, if we find ourselves in a situation like we did with Forest Heights, where the scale of the outbreak is such that you know if you could have normally been fine with a smaller outbreak and with four people in a room, but you're no longer fine because now it's ten times that number of people, then there needs to be customized solutions for that home. So it's not a it's not a black and white answer in terms of oh this is the situation in the home oh we have to do uh, we have to do X. It it really depends on a on, on an assessment that's very um, unique to the home and um, that um, that is that is done on a daily basis as well. Okay, um, we've had several calls to our newsroom from. Employees mm -hmm. at uh, Conestoga Meat Packers claiming there are several employees there with COVID-19. Um, are you able to say how many positive cases have been confirmed there by public health? Um, no, uh, we're not a we're not aware of an outbreak situation at that at that workplace. And um, I think you know if if the employees have concerns about about that workplace, um, then they need to raise those with the Ministry of Labor. I hope hopefully they they're aware of the contacts, but that's what they would need to go. Okay. And uh, finally, um, the Centers for Disease Control is warning that a second wave of the coronavirus this winter will be worse. What is your take on this? Mm -hmm. So um, we are planning, you know, the province, Canada, ourselves are planning for the possibility of a second wave in the fall. Um, you know, that's very possible. And that's what the experts say could be coming. Um, but whether or not it'll be worse or not, I don't think that's possible to predict. And I, and I think, at least not at this time, and I think that it will depend a lot on how we do with this first wave. Uh, it will, and, and so that's why right now we have to be focused on, you know, minimizing as much as possible the impacts uh, in this first wave uh, so that we can be better prepared, prepared for any subsequent waves. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. We'll move on to Joanna from the record. Go ahead, Joanna. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wong, I was hoping you could tell me a bit more about mm -hmm. sort of what the care will be provided to the Forest Heights residents who are moving into hospital beds. That care, I assume, will be provided by hospital staff? Mm -hmm. Yes, that care will be provided by hospital staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hospitalists are in communication with the physicians at Forest Heights who were caring for these patients, just so that, you know, their care can be transferred smoothly and the and the, and the care plans for these, for these patients, uh, sorry, uh, for these residents who are now patients, uh, but for these residents who were developed with the families, et cetera, uh, can continue to be followed in the hospital setting. So, uh, yeah. And hospital, the hospitals have enough staffing to take on these extra patients? Yes, and that's why they, um, that's why they offered up the spaces. Okay. And we touch capacity, as you know, has been a bit lower than what was anticipated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you you're, I, cut, I cut you off there. Yeah. Um, we were talking briefly about Trinity Village. Is there a possibility that some of those patients will move into the hospitals? Um, you know, we know that the goal is to try to support. Um, residents in their homes usually that's the goal because that's their homes and that's where they want to generally be cared for mm -hmm. um that said you know uh this is this is a situation that we're monitoring very carefully at this time what we've been doing what the health system response team has been doing uh with trinity is um working on ensuring that they have sufficient staffing because they've had a number of 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 their of their uh, their staff who um have had to you know, be isolated or have gone off sick. And so uh, that's been like a primary focus of the work of the, of the response team with, with Trinity Village. But it's a, uh, you know, it's a very, um, it's something we, we are talking about and, and, and monitoring every single day. And uh, so we'll have to see what mm -hmm. comes, next, but uh, we're, we're there to support them. And then my second question for a colleague, uh, maybe it's best sure. for Mike. Um, yeah. <laughs> would the region consider um, an overnight curfew as some cities have in uh, Canada or is that sort of covered under the uh, physical distancing recommendations? Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the emergency orders from the province that are in place that's what we're monitoring. And we're, act, you know, as I said, we're actually seeing good compliance with um, the directives around physical distancing, avoiding large gatherings, those kinds of things. So I think as long as we're seeing good compliance with the directives that are in place, uh, then I don't think we see the need at this point for additional measures. And, you know, we've said that all along that um, if we're not seeing compliance and we need to take additional steps, we do have that ability under the regional declaration of emergency um, to take those steps, but you know, un unless or until that that need is is clearly demonstrated, um, we won't take those further steps. All right, thank you. Uh, those were my questions. Thank you, Joanna. We'll move on to Damon from Woolwich Observer. Hello. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Wong. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, long-term facilities getting out of their outbreaks. Um, what further measures are being put in place to prevent a second outbreak in these areas? Yeah, that's a good question, Damon. So they have very strict measures that are going to that are still going to be in in place. Um, so, for example, you know there continues to be active screening and limitation of visitors uh, to only essential visitors, as uh, well as a very you know, strict surveillance plan in which they will be monitoring their residents and staff daily. So uh, we know it's really important, uh, even if a home has been declared out of outbreak per se, to continue those strict measures in order to try to prevent another occurrence. Okay, thank you. My next question is for Mike. Um, I know you can't speak to too many specifics of a potential rollback into business. Um, 
Will we see like increased ridership on the GRT around the May long weekend? Is that anticipated or will services still be reduced? Yes, you know, services reduced like kind of until further notice and part of the whole reopening recovery plan will, will be when and how do we uh, gradually expand transit service and what measures do we put in place to make sure that um, we have a safe environment both for our operators and for passengers. And so I think that's what we need to get to that point where we can ensure that it's safe for operators and safe for passengers. And then, you know, we'll be able to kind of ramp up service again. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions for today. Okay, and I heard from Kevin uh, that he has no further questions. So I'll do a last call to see if anyone had anything that they wanted to further ask. I see Ben's hand up. Okay, Ben, go ahead. Thank you. This is just a quick question about community spread since we are seeing it continue to decline. I'm just wondering if we know how long community assessment centers would continue to operate if they're if those are just going to keep going until we have a vaccine and this is all over or if there's an amount of a lack of community spread that would lead to us being able to shut those down temporarily. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the community assessment centers, even if they're getting, you know, um, um, well, actually, they're, they're, they're continuing to be, we're, we're working to continue to leverage their capacity as much as possible because um, we have, um, you know, uh, t expanded testing needs in other groups. So, for example, um, there's a mobile uh, team or mobile teams that can be formed from the staff of those community assessment centers in order to go into certain places where it might not be easy for either the uh, for either the residents or the the staff uh, to be assessed and tested, um, so it, you know it's we're, we're we're leveraging. There's actually four in our region, right? There's uh, the hospital clinics, and there's um, uh, there's the uh, community assessment centers. Uh, one at Cambridge Memorial, even though it's the hospital, it's a community assessment center, and one. In, in KW. And uh, what we're doing right now is because of the, the enhanced testing needs uh, in these uh, more vulnerable settings, the capacity of these assessment centers and, and of their staff is being ramped up right now in order to uh, continue to support the enhanced testing needs across our region. Uh, I, don't have, I don't know when we'll ever come to a time when we'll be scaling down their activities, but uh, right now I'm just very grateful uh, for their ability to continue to uh, to um, to help us test, um, uh, you know, across these groups. In fact, um, you know, most of the testing um, of of um, uh, uh, most of the testing that's occurred that occurred in the early phases when we expanded testing to long-term care home retirement homes was done by these mobile teams, and and um, you know. Going forward, a lot of the testing um, that uh, needs to occur with uh, healthcare workers in these settings are, are going to be done um, by either the hospital clinics or the community assessment center or their mobile teams. It's a very dynamic situation. Uh, the goal is to maximize the number of people that should be tested who are tested and to as much as possible uh, make it um, you know, uh, convenient and easy uh, for these settings uh, to access uh, these uh, these testing services. Okay, thank you. Oh, I see Kate's and Nicole's yeah. hand up. So we'll go Kate next. Uh, thank you, I already unmuted, so I assumed it was me. Um, I just, uh, with talking about the lack of community spread, or not the lack, the, the decrease yeah. in community yeah. spread, um, I just wanted to also just give you another opportunity to say that this isn't a time to relax no, um, absolutely, it's anything. not. No, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's good news that from a, you know, from a community spread perspective, uh, we seem to have uh, slowed down, right? Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have another wave that's that's occurring right now in in in, in the more vulnerable settings, uh, and so it's 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 really important for people to understand that, you know. The, the, the two are linked. <laughs> we don't normally have 
spread of COVID in closed settings. And so, um, you know, usually that comes from the outside. And so it's important that we continue with all our measures, uh, even for community spread, it's important that, you know, we not let up our measures uh, because if we do that, it could go up again really rapidly. Um, so we need to not let up any of the measures that we have in place right now uh, we need to continue the efforts in the long-term care homes, retirement homes, et cetera. Uh, and we need to take this day by day, week by week, and then we'll be in a better position, I, I anticipate in a few weeks from now, to start looking at things, assuming the curve continues to go in the direction that we want or the curves. In a few weeks time, we'll be in a better position to look at what we may be able to do you know, um, to, to maybe relax some of the measures. As Mike said, a lot of that will be coming from the province. They have all the data from all the health regions in order to be to better assess, you know, what should be done across the province. And uh, we'll see, um, you know, um, what the direction is and then we'll implement it. Thank you. Okay, Nicole, go ahead. I have two quick questions. Um, one is, um, of the 40 residents, um, you know, if one of them uh, passes away, will they be, um, from Foresight, the 40 residents who go to the hospital, will they be on the dashboard listed under the um, facility that they came from, like Forest Heights, or will, does my question make sense? Oh, I understand what you're trying to say. Okay, yes. Well, yeah, abso absolutely. We'll, we'll, we're we're going to be looking at collecting the numbers so we can have a good sense of, um, you know, if the deaths are associated with the specific outbreak. It depends on when the death occurs and when we, well, actually, actually depends on when the, if somebody dies, when their illness occurs. Okay. So for example, if the illness occurs, you know, three weeks from after the, from after they, they're no longer at Forest Heights and it's not because they were exposed at Forest Heights, right? And so we'll have to take a look at that carefully so we can attribute, um, as you suggest, carefully where the deaths should be uh, put, put together. Okay, and the last one um, is for, uh, you know, our Muslim community here in Waterloo Region because Ramadan starts uh, tomorrow mm -hmm. and prayer services are usually quite busy at the local masjids when Ramadan's happening. So any advice or any, um, you know, thing that you want to say to yeah. our Muslim community? Yes. The exact same advice. Uh, I'll let Mike speak. Oh, I, I'm sure this is what Dr. Wong was going to say, which is follow the current guidelines, which is no large gatherings, no mm -hmm. large gatherings. Um, and, and, you know, I think actually the all, the faith, all the faith communities have embraced that. Uh, yes. they, they really have. Um, so, I'm confident that they understand uh, what they need to do and that they'll respect that. Mm -hmm. And and I think I think Chair Redmond wanted to comment on Kate's question. If I can just really quickly, Kate, it's a really, really important question. There are so many people, I get emails daily of people saying, is physical isolating making a difference? And, and it's a dual message that yes, it is making a difference. And now is not the time to become complacent about this. So whatever you can do to get that message out, I think we've repeated it um, so many times, but people need to internalize the fact that their action by uh, physically distancing is actually what is keeping that community spread um, in the, going in the right direction or a better direction. Yeah, and when I did a press briefing, I forget now, a week or two ago, and I released some death projections, uh, they also contained in those numbers, uh, in, the, in my press briefing written, written notes, which are now on the web, <laughs> uh, they also contain um, estimates of how many deaths have been prevented as a result of the measures that we put in place. So that's another, and, and they were very significant. And so, um, yeah, it's hard to see what it's hard to see what has been prevented, right? Because it hasn't appeared. Um, but that's what you know. Those projections help us uh, assess, and that would have been many more, many more deaths in our community otherwise. Okay, so I don't see any more hands going up. 
So I think that this concludes our media briefing for today. Thank you all for participating and we will see you again on Friday. Take care, everyone. Thank you.